Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Patrick DeFonzo. I'm a senior advisor for Behavioral Insights at the OSC, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Matthew Ken, who's also a senior advisor for Behavioral Insights. Matthew and I work for the Research and Behavioral Insights team within the Thought Leadership Group at the OSC, and I'll explain in just a few moments what our what our work is really all about. And today we're focusing on two of our public research reports, uh, one of them focusing on artificial intelligence and retail investing, and the other on gamification and retail investing. Just a quick reminder that if you have questions throughout today's webinar, uh, please use the uh, question function in the GoToWebinar control panel to submit your questions, and then we'll have a dedicated time at the end of the webinar to address those. So to kick things off, just a quick disclaimer that the views being expressed are our own and do not necessarily represent the views of the Ontario Securities Commission. So as I mentioned, Matthew and I work in behavioral insights at the OSC and for, and for many folks on, on the uh, webinar today, you might be unfamiliar with what this is. So we thought we'd give you a brief introduction to explain what that, uh, what that field is really all about. Some other terms that are kind of synonymous with behavioral insights would be behavioral science, behavioral psychology, behavioral economics. You may have heard some of these uh, in passing. So to give you an introduction, if I were to ask people on the call today, I won't ask for, for any answers on the webinar, but in the past we've asked this question, uh, and you think about our world today, if you had to pick individuals or, or roles or professions that you would say are unbiased, objective, and rational, who would it be? And typically when we ask this question, the responses that we get are accountants, lawyers is a very popular one, uh, sometimes we even get politicians, um, but the most popular one that we get is judges. And when you think about it, it kind of makes sense. Judges have to hear the arguments on both sides of a case, they have to balance the facts, and they have to come to an un unbiased, objective ruling. And given that we have this assumption about judges in our world, behavioral scientists, so people from our field, have basically said, all right, let's do a bunch of research into these people to see if that assumption actually holds up in the real world. So what if I told you that studies have found that judges hand out harsher sentences the day after their favorite football team loses? This was a study conducted in Louisiana State. Judges were fans of the college LSU football team. Controlling for all other factors, the day after their team loses, they hand out harsher sentences. But if I also told you that research has found that judges rely heavily on a defendant's mugshot when making pretrial decisions. So when a judge's decision to grant bail to somebody or not, controlling for the nature of the crime, the, the defendant's past history with crime, it's the mugshot that is most predictive of that pretrial decision. And finally, studies have found that judges hand out harsher sentences the day after switching to daylight savings time. So they lose an hour of sleep, not just their kids that are a little grumpy, apparently they are too, and they hand out harsher sentences. And the question that you would ask from this research is basically, what does a football game, a mugshot, and daylight savings time have to do with the nature of a case? And the answer obviously is absolutely nothing. They're completely irrelevant factors. And yet, they materially influence the decision-making of judges. And the implication of this basically is that if these individuals who we consider to be these, these pillars of objectivity, of balanced decision-making, if even their behavior and decisions are influenced by completely arbitrary factors, then it's quite likely that all of our behavior is influenced by these factors as well. And this is really what behavioral science or behavioral insights as a field is all about. It's about understanding what drives human behavior. The things that we're aware of and the things that we might not be aware are influencing our behavior. So behavioral science as a field, it grew really from a deviation from traditional economics. So some of the folks on today's webinar who are more familiar with econ economics would be uh, already familiar with this, but in traditional economics, the assumption of the human economic agent is basically this person who is uh, perfectly rational, possesses unlimited access to information, has unlimited attention and memory, makes cold, calculated decisions. They kind of behave like this guy. I think intuitively most of us know that this assumption isn't necessarily true in the real world, or at least we, we probably know it about ourselves. Uh, and this is where behavioral insights as a field started. 
So behavioral insights basically challenge that core assumption of economics and puts forward that human beings don't always behave perfectly rationally. We don't have unlimited access to information, unlimited attention or memory. Our behavior is influenced by emotions, by our intuition, by behavioral biases. In reality, we behave a little bit more like this guy. And our research at the OSC is really focused on two things. And the field of behavioral insights is focused on two main things. The first is understanding human behavior. So how can we do research and how can we understand how market participants behave in a wide variety of settings? So this could be retail investors in the context of artificial intelligence or in the context of gamification, which are the two reports we're gonna talk about. And it could be a vast range of other areas as well. And the second focus of behavioral insights is about influencing or changing behavior. So this is about designing strategies that can influence the behavior of market participants in ways that furthers the OSC's mandate. So it could be in investor protection, fostering fair and efficient capital markets or the like. So that gives you an overview of what behavioral insights as a field is all about. And now I'm gonna get into our recent research report in the context of artificial intelligence. And then my colleague, Matthew, will speak about our research on gamification. So as a bit of background, I don't think I need to tell anybody on the call today about the, the recent increase in, in recent years in, in the scale and the capabilities of artificial intelligence systems. Uh, within the context of retail investing, these systems pre present both potential benefits and risks for retail investors. And we're gonna get into some of those in just a moment. Uh, the sentiment and adoption around these technologies might be changing, particularly as investors become more accustomed and used to these systems in terms of how they use them. So within this context, our team conducted a research report and basically we had two broad objectives with this research. The first was we wanted to go out and look at all of the current use cases of AI within the context of retail investing. So how are retail investors currently using AI systems? And the second, which is much more, I would say, related to behavioral insights, is we wanted to measure the effects of AI systems on investor attitudes, behavior, and decision making, which is a very broad goal, but we're going to get much more specific with it uh, in just a few moments. So to accomplish these goals, we conducted a, mi a mixed methods research approach, and we had two streams. So the first stream we had was what we would call broadly desk research. So we conducted a review of existing literature, and we also scanned some existing platforms or AI tools that were investor facing in both Canada and abroad. And the objective of this was really to identify what the current use cases of AI are in the context of retail investing. And then our second research stream was a behavioral science experiment. So we conducted an online experiment within one particular use case, and we focused how the source of an investment suggestion impacts the extent to which investors follow that suggestion. And I'm gonna go into a lot more detail about that experiment. So our first research stream, the results of this were identifying three broad use cases of AI specific to retail investors that we currently saw. And we conducted this research in, in 2023. So the first use case is decision support. So these are broadly systems that provide recommendations or advice to really guide the decisions of retail investors. Our second use case was automation. So these are systems that could automate portfolio or fund management for investors. So this would include things like robo-advising and it would also include AI-driven ETFs that uh, are using some sort of AI system to drive, whether it's the asset allocation or to drive returns under the underlying asset. And then the third use case, which is a little bit more negative, which again, I don't think is gonna surprise anybody on the call is scams and fraud. So this is the usage of AI systems to facilitate scams or fraud that targets retail investors and also frauds that capitalize on the buzz of AI. So an example of one that, you, that a lot of people have heard of is something like quantum AI, which is uh, scamming investors using AI uh, to promise returns that of course uh, won't happen. So we conducted um, an online randomized controlled trial, and this is the gold standard for experimentation within our field. And this was our, our second research stream, which was again focusing on uh, investor behavior when interacting with AI systems. And 
our experiment really was testing how closely Canadians followed an investment suggestion for how to invest a hypothetical or, or fictitious $20,000 across three asset classes, equities, fixed income, and cash. And we had really two main elements to this experiment. So the first one was that we varied who provided the investment suggestion. So it came from one of three sources. So it was either a human financial services provider or like a human advisor, an AI investment tool, or a combination of the two, what we refer to as this blended approach. So a human provider that's using an AI tool to inform their suggestion. And the second thing that we varied in the experiment was actually sort of like the quality of the suggestion. So we varied whether the suggestion was sound or unsound, and this was based on widely accepted principles for investing. So if you were a participant in this experiment, you would basically be randomized into one of these conditions. You'd receive either an unsound or a sound suggestion, and it would come from either a human provider, an AI tool, or a combination of the two. So to give you a flavor of what this would look like from a participant's point of view, in the top left, you see the condition for the human provider. So you have this human financial services advisor or provider who introduces himself, provi provides a bit of context, and basically says, all right, let's, let's invest your money together. In the bottom left, you see the AI tool condition, which is this AI investment tool named Kai, which introduces itself, talks about what the tool uses to make asset allocation suggestions and says, let's uh, let's invest your money together. And then on the right, you see the blended condition. So this is the financial services provider named Alex, who's introducing himself and also saying in his introduction that he uses Kai, an investment tool, to help inform the suggestions that he makes to investors. So as a participant, you would be randomized into one of these three conditions. After you, in, you are introduced to your uh, financial services provider, whether it's the, the blended approach, the AI tool, or the human provider, all the participants then completed a three-part investor questionnaire. It was intentionally simplified for the purposes of our experiment, but they were basically asked a question around their age, uh, their time horizon, when they're gonna need the money, and their risk tolerance towards investing. And based on the, their answers to these three questions, we then classified participants as either a conservative investor, a uh, balanced investor, or a growth investor. And, and the classification would be pretty simple, as you can imagine. So it would be, you know, if you were 20 years old, you didn't need the money for 10 years, and you had a high risk tolerance, you'd be classified as a growth investor. And then once they completed the investor questionnaire, the participants would then be taken to this screen and basically asked to invest their $20,000 of, of play money. Prior to doing so, what you can also see on the screen though is that their provider gives them a suggestion for how they might invest their money. And this is based on their responses to the questionnaire they just completed. Now the important part to note here is that obviously you're getting the suggestion from one of the three sources we talked about earlier, the human advisor, the AI tool, or a combination of the two. And we also at this point vary whether the suggestion is sound or unsound. So an example of a sound suggestion would be like I just talked about, let's say you're 20 years old, long-term time horizon, high risk tolerance, you'd be classified as a growth investor in both the sound and unsound conditions. But in the sound condition, you would be given an actual sound suggestion. So it would be something like 80% stocks, 15% fixed income, 5% cash. Whereas in the unsound condition, you'd still be classified as a growth investor, but you'd be given something like 80% fixed income, 15% stocks, 5% cash. So very obviously sound or unsound. Uh, based on the investor profile. And then the, the participants are then basically asked to invest their $20,000. And then our outcome of interest basically is how closely do people follow the suggestion that they're given? And how does that depend on the nature of, of, of the advice? So whether it's sound or unsound and who is delivering that suggestion? So to show you our results, to answer those two, those two key questions, the first is that reassuringly, sound advice was followed more closely than unsound advice. So a higher bar here basically means you deviated more from the suggestion that you were provided, and a lower bar means you deviated less from it, you followed it more closely. So this was the first main thing that we found, good news, reassuring, and these are statistically significant findings and a significant difference between the two, the two conditions. 
as for our, our more central question, we got a little bit more of uh, a nuanced finding here. So we found small, but importantly, not statistically significant differences across our three sources of investment suggestion. So as you can see here, the human, the blended, and the AI groups had small differences in terms of how people followed the suggestions provided, but none of these are statistically significant. So we cannot be certain that this isn't just due to chance in our experiment. There's two things that I would note here though. The first is that, as you can see, the blended condition has the lowest bar, which basically means they have the highest amount of adherence to the investment suggestion. And the second thing I would point out is that there is virtually no difference between the human condition and the AI condition. And those things are important for a couple of reasons. So the, the implications from this research, the first, like I just highlighted, this initial data that we found, again, we have to interpret it with caution because we don't find statistically significant findings. It does suggest this preference for blended advice. The data is what we would say is trending that way, but we can't be certain in the results. And I think blended advice pre presents potentially a lot of benefits to investors. We could be combining the benefits of both human advisors and AI systems, obviously with the proper and appropriate guardrails in place. And based on our research conducted, we do think that there is, there's, there's potential for this avenue of advice. Secondly, like I mentioned, there was no difference between the human and AI only conditions. And actually what this would suggest is that contrary to what we may have seen in some of our research and our desk research, Canadians didn't have a clear aversion towards receiving advice from AI systems. It's not like they preferred the human condition much more than the AI tool condition. There was no difference between the two, which we think is interesting. And again, potentially uh, an openness among Canadians to receiving these types of suggestions from AI systems. And this openness is something that potentially could grow uh, as, as investors become more and more familiar and comfortable with AI technologies. And the final implication is that given that both the blended condition and obviously the AI only condition are reliant on AI systems, we, we do need to emphasize the fact that these systems, if they're going to provide investment advice and recommendations, they need to be based on unbiased, high quality data uh, in a way that's going to, to further our mandate of investor protection. So those are the main implications for our research on artificial intelligence and retail investing. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, if you've had questions along the way, continue to submit them and we can address them at the end in our Q&A section. But I'll now, I'll now pass it on to my colleague, Matthew, who's gonna present on our research on gamification and retail investing. Thanks, Patrick. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about our gamification report. Uh, this new gamification report, uh, which was published in October, is a continuation of our 2022 gamification report and includes some new and exciting experimental findings. To provide you with some context, this research started when a wave of digital investing platforms expanded market participation for retail investors in Canada and around the world. This access has lowered the bar to entry for retail investors. However, there is some concern for some of these digital engagement practices or DEPs that are used on these platforms. And these DEPs may influence investor behavior which has become a concern for regulators. These DEPs, often referred to as gamification, use insights from behavioral science to influence investor behavior. Now you might wonder, what is gamification? So gamification refers to a variety of behavioral techniques that integrate game-related elements into non-gaming contexts in applications with the purpose of improving user experience and engagement. Simply put, uh, it is about making boring things fun and when boring things become fun, that can increase motivation. Now this graphic here helps us demonstrate how we conceptualize gamification within digital engagement practices. Gamification techniques are nested within these behavioral techniques in general, 
which in turn are nested within digital engagement practices. There are a number of other DEPs, which include predictive analytics, differential marketing, design elements and features, AI, and dark patterns. A common mistake here is that the term gamification is often loosely used to encapsulate a number of behavioral techniques that are actually not gamification. Now moving on to our research, here we can see the experimental overview. Uh, and as mentioned, we conducted an experiment examining these gamification and other behavioral techniques. In our experiment, we tested three applications based on these gamification and other behavioral techniques within online trading platforms. Specifically, we looked at social interactions, social norms data, as well as copy trading. And we wanted to know, how do these techniques influence the trading behavior of retail investors? We conducted uh, an experiment that was a randomized controlled trial, or RCT, with over 3,500 participants engaging in a simulated trading platform activity using both mobile and desktop. One of the key outcomes of interest was the trading of the stocks that were promoted within the experiment. In other words, we were looking at herding behavior. And so let's take a look at how these stocks were promoted. The first way uh, was through social interactions. There are design elements that enable users to interact with others by generating, sharing, and reacting to content and engaging in direct messaging. These social interactions increase user engagement and attention to the content that is discussed. So the screenshot on the right here in the screenshot, you will see what participants saw in the, partic on, in the experiment. During the trading activity, participants were exposed to a social feed with fictitious posts promoting certain stocks from other platform users. People could see the number of comments and likes for each post. And so we hypothesized that social interactions that promote certain stocks would increase trading activities in those particular stocks. Second, we have the social norms data, which are design features that signal social norms. That is information about how others think and behave. And as people, we often look to others to see how they behave, uh, to inform how we behave, especially if we are unsure on how to behave. On the right side here, you will see the experimental screenshot where we showed participants how many people have bought and sold each stock. We hypothesized that, a, that social norms data would increase trading activity in the promoted stocks. Finally, we have copy trading and these are platform functionalities that allow users to copy the trades of other profiled users. People may copy trade because of a perceived expertise of other users and because it is easier to do so than to do their own research. On the right side here, you will see the experiment screenshot where it shows a particular trader and how that particular trader has done in the past week what they are currently recommending and what the trades actually look like. We hypothesize that copy trading would increase trading activity in the promoted stocks. And so let's take a look at some of our findings. Compared to the control group, which simply did the standard simulated trading activity, the social interactions feed and the copy trading group significantly had significantly increased in terms of trading in the promoted stocks at 12% and 18% respectively. This is clear evidence to us that social interactions feed and the copy trading both led to increased herding behavior.
However, we do not find that the social norms influence the trading of the promoted stocks. That said, this does not necessarily mean that social norms, the social norms data did not have any effect at all. It just didn't have an effect in our experiment. So the social norms data may actually have an effect within another context. In terms of implications of our research, we want to focus on, in, on the socially based engagement techniques. So these techniques, uh, social interactions feed, copy trading, as well as top traded lists, which were first examined in our original gamification experiment, these techniques can influence investors to trade specific assets. In other words, these techniques can lead to herding. In past research, it has been shown that herding can lead to low returns. And this is concerning when it is combined with other research findings that have shown that social interactions and copy trading can increase risk taking. The key takeaway here from our research is that digital engagement practices can meaningfully influence investor behavior, often in ways that are not in the best interests of investors.